Good evening, all. Good evening. Hello, hello. Good evening, all. With respect to your time tonight, we are going to go ahead and get started promptly with our 6.30 meeting. First, I want to thank you for joining us on tonight. My name is Jason Parson with Parson and Associates. We are communication firm located in the historic jazz district. We are excited to work on the program. And so tonight, what we have is a presentation regarding the green infrastructure project talking about opportunities. We actually have, you get the best of both worlds. You have the opportunity to hear about the green infrastructure project, and then you get a chance to hear from Cabis as well. So we're going to kind of work in tandem. And, and the point is, is that both of these projects complement each other. We hope to, for our work to be seamless and, and, and one in which that you see multiple benefits. And so at this point, we have a number of our, 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 our team members here in the room. I'll start to my left because we're in with Brian and he'll take over the presentation in the game. So I'll start with my left with Serene. You want to introduce yourself? Good evening, everyone. I'm Serene Dalvani, a smart cell office of Casey Water. Uh, appreciate uh, seeing all the evening. Drew Matrician, I'm with the Smart Sewer Program and I'm the task lead for public outreach. Alex Miller, I'm one of the associates of Parson and Associates. And we know Trevisa. Hi, y'all. My name Hi. is Trevisa, and I'm the city designer with Zerio. Next to me is Becca Pruitt. I'm a landscape designer with Zerio. All right. Yeah, I'm Kyle Condors. Uh, I'm also with the Smart Sewer Program, and I'm the lead for all design projects. And more and more, I'm with the Smart Sewer Program as well, and I'm the lead for green infrastructure. Hey, hi, I'm Brian Hess. I'm uh, with KC Water, and my title is the Smart Sewer Division Head. So you might be asking yourself, what is Smart Sewer? Um, smart Sewer is a division of KC Water and a program that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, in place that. Um, helps to um, basically run our program that helps minimize overflow from our combined sewer system. So the EPA has given us this consent decree, which gives us certain requirements that we have to meet, certain projects that we have to meet uh, and have completed on, on time. And um, that program has a multitude of different things that happen in that. And part of that is uh, we come out and we meet with, uh, with the public. We get feedback from the community and we put that info and that, that, uh, that feedback into our projects. And that's what we're wanting to do here tonight. So um, I'll, I'll just start this off with, uh, this is about green infrastructure opportunities that we have in the area of 37th North. And that really is bounded by 33rd Street to 38th Street and uh, right in that northern area, Avenue area. So um, we have a project that uh, we want to present to you, not basically in the ideas for some projects that we have that includes green infrastructure and wanting to get some feedback from it. Um, first of all, I'll just kind of go through what I talked about before, but the Kansas City Smart Sewer Program is a program in place for fixing our sewer infrastructure. Um, it's a 30-year program. It's roughly in the area of $2.7 billion over that 30 years and then beyond that. So uh, we want to prevent overflows from our combined sewer system. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means here in some other slides. But um, it's about protecting the public health and the environment. And like I said, complying with the consent decree that was uh, handed down to the city by the EPA. Uh, the combined sewer system isn't the entire city, but it's made up of an area of about 58 square miles. It's in the older area of town, uh, the earliest that was built out in that time frame uh, before we created the separate sewer system, which is the green areas on that diagram or on that uh, uh, map on the outs, outer edges, the newer portion of the town, uh, the sewer system, the waste from the homes was in the same pipes as the stormwater. So you would get that mix when you get big storms. 
And that's what I'll talk about a little bit here. But the area that we're talking about at 37th and Norton is within this combined sewer system area. Um, and we have particular projects that we want to um, we want to undertake to, to try and mitigate uh, these combined sewer overflows. So what is combined sewer overflow? Combined sewer and a separate sewer are um, both designed to take wastewater away from the homes and businesses from properties. But, and I don't know how easily you can see this here, our combined sewer system has one single pipe the lower flows actually are, they hit a dam here and the waste goes to a wastewater plant. In a separate sewer system, you have separate pipes, wastewater goes to the treatment plant. There's no stormwater in that pipe. Stormwater is collected and discharged out to the river and creeks and such in a separate pipe. So those stay separate as it's, as it's called. But in the combined, the, the low flows, the uh, flows that we have from wastewater are in this pipe and take it to the treatment plant. But when we have large storms or, or storms that uh, get into those pipes, which is a pretty frequent uh, basis, uh, that stormwater will mix and then overwhelm the pipes. And some of that does overflow into the creeks, streams, rivers, and such. And so we have that in, in various areas um, that we've identified throughout the city in the combined sewer area. And we're taking the opportunity to try and correct those as many as we can and, and prevent that overflow situation. In particular, what we're looking at is a, is a combined sewer overflow outlet. So if you look back here, we have this, this outlet where those fixed flows come out. We have one of those here, what we, we, we call combined sewer overflow 40. This is a vineyard. And the cross street is not on here very well, but it's in Vineyard Park. So there's a, a creek that runs through Vineyard Park. This area here in the blue is the uh, area of stormwater that drains to that particular point. So that, that's important because as we showed, the stormwater that gets into that system, that gets into those pipes, contributes to how that water then overflows to this outfall. And this right here is that outfall. This is a picture of it. That's a very large arch pipe. And that's where the stormwater comes out of. In low flows, it's actually um, under here in this, can't see it very well, but there's an 18 inch clay pipe that the wastewater runs through. And it comes through here. So when when this storm mixes and this uh, 18 inch pipe gets full, that mixed waste with the stormwater diluted will come into that creek. And so that's, that's where you have a combined sewer overflow. And the EPA requirement is for us to address those and this one in particular. We did put together a project to, to um, address this CSO and what, what we had in that project was uh, created a relief sewer. So that 18 inch pipe that you saw that carried the wastewater flows, what we do is in a relief sewer is we oversize that, build one next to it that can handle more of that stormwater, more of that waste, and bring it down to a location where it ties into a larger pipe. Therefore that helps to prevent those, uh, reduce uh, those overflows that would occur because you still have the same situation back here. We just make this pipe bigger to carry more. But you can, can, you can see where that pipe is. That's in the bottom of a creek, uh, not very accessible um, in the middle of a wooded area within uh, a park. So not, not the ideal situation to uh, build a sewer next to that pipe. But we did design this project, we did put it out to bid, and uh, ran into some obstacles, I guess you would say. So we are looking at an, an, another project. And just to go back and, and talk about this a little bit, we had about 3,400 feet of pipe, 42 inch pipe, so of almost a four foot diameter pipe 
And then those would take uh, that additional flow, like I talked about, upsizing the, that 18 inch pipe all the way down to uh, our main interceptor there. The uh, drivers for an alternative project, but that when we took the bids for that project, they were well above what we anticipate. And we also looked at the challenge of the constructability, which is what our, our contractors told us when we got into that, um, that it was gonna be very difficult and very uh, destructive, I guess, to get in there and, and build those sewers as we had originally designed. So uh, the consent decree that I talked about, we have uh, some measures in there that let us look at some of these projects and, and adapt. So uh, the consent decree that we recently modified also talks more about the use of green infrastructure, more sustainable infrastructure to help address some of these CSOs. Um, and, and what that entails is to capture that stormwater that overwhelms the pipe upstream in order to help um, minimize that that combined contribution of stormwater and wastewater. So we did look at what alternatives that we may have uh, to that original project. So we've proposed another alternative, this alternative project that we're calling right now 37 to Norton. And this uh, uh, looks at some green infrastructure storage uh, in this stormwater collection area of it's about 195 acres and we're wanting to capture uh, a good deal of that stormwater and hold it um, so that it doesn't get into those pipes in general that's that's what we want to do but <clears throat> with this uh, with this green infrastructure alternative it turns out that it's a, a more effective project than what we had originally designed and so um not to mention that it's more sustainable and there's some other things that we can do with green infrastructure that we can't do when we build a pipe under the ground. And, you know, a lot of destruction goes into burying those pipes in some cases. Uh, this is a little closer up view. And I don't know if you guys can see that very well out here. Yeah, I can get on stage. Let me just give you some uh, bearings here. But uh, this is... This is the furthest north of that uh, uh, this alternative site that I um, project that I get there. This northernmost street is 33rd Street. This is 34th and 35th, and then 36th, 37th down uh, down the road there. Norton here's in the middle, and these would be pasted on top of each other. We just obviously didn't have enough room on the screen here, so this shows. Those potential areas of green infrastructure uh, that we have identified within these uh, within this drainage basin to help capture the stormwater and hold it, infiltrate it, and treat it um, to keep it out of the pipe so that the sewer does not overflow out straight, if that makes sense. Um, so this is capturing what would be Stormwater uh, coming from the sky. Uh, there's no mixed uh, wastewater or anything of that nature in it. This is purely just keeping that stormwater uh, from entering those pipes and holding it until the surge of those rains get past. And then you can release, even in some cases, back into the system. I'm going to turn it over now to Lauren or to talk a little bit more about what is green infrastructure and and how it's used? Yeah. So green infrastructure, if you have it gleaned by now, is a stormwater management practice, but it's meant to manage stormwater more closely to the way that nature originally intended. So that's by capturing stormwater where it falls, holding it there and trying to infiltrate it some and keep it out of the pipe system. So water is our most precious resource, right? And uh, a lot of the way underground systems treat it is, is kind of like a waste product. They capture it and they take it away in a pipe. So green infrastructure tries to flip the narrative on that and keep the rain where it is and infiltrate it into the ground. 
So how does it work? Um, it slows, absorbs, filters stormwater. So green infrastructure has soil, special soil and rock media that it can absorb that water to the ground and keep it where it is or slowly release it back to our combined sewer system or our separate sewer system at a rate that doesn't overflow or cause an overflow. It um, just naturally replenishes groundwater. So when we're keeping it there, we're letting the water go back to where it came from and kind of close the circle on that hydrologic process. It also naturally helps us sustain plants. Our plants are also a life product that rely on water. Um, and it, to our benefit, works very well with gray infrastructure. So that's why we're looking at this alternative project. Um, so with the way it functions, it captures that stormwater and it can hold it temporarily and keep it out of that pipe system. So it creates more space in that pipe system so that we're not, again, over it and making overflows happen. Um, and then last but not least, it's a great water quality benefit just in and of itself. So the process of filtering through that media captures a lot of those pollutants that we see in stormwater runoff. So some of the benefits of green infrastructure, like I just mentioned, water quality. So we kind of look at this on two fronts. On the combined sewer system side of things, we're improving water quality by reducing the amount of combined sewer overflow that's reaching our creeks, rivers, and streams. So that's a huge water quality benefit. But you also see benefits to it in a separate system, just again, by filtering those natural pollutants that come off of our streets, our houses, our yards, and keeping that out of our creeks, rivers, and streams as well. But the greatest part, in my opinion, about green infrastructure is it comes with a slew of other community benefits. So as Brian alluded to, these projects that go on, while they're very important, um, these traditional grade projects that go on, they are really not seen by the public. So you guys know they're going on because your area is torn up and construction's in place, and then they go underground and you never see it again. And you don't know the benefit that that's giving you. Whereas green infrastructure brings that stormwater management to the surface where you get this public amenity um, where you can see the natural beautification that happens when you're putting in green areas, um, which improves quality of life. Um, it also can help to reduce some of that localized flooding by giving that stormwater a place to go and improves air quality as well as water quality. So the natural processes that happen with that plant uptake and um, the native plants that are in there helps improve our air too. Um, with those native plantings, you get natural habitat creation. So areas for pollinators to go and some connectivity of that, that natural habitat. And it also promotes green collar jobs, which I'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute. But um, these are living systems. They need to be maintained to maintain their function. So that in and of itself creates a need for a workforce that can maintain these landscaped areas. So our main goals with green infrastructure projects is um, to protect our water resources through effective stormwater management um, and overflow reduction. So from the smart sewer standpoint, we have to always keep in mind that higher goal of reducing combined sewer overflows. That's what we're charged to do with the city's dollars, and that's what we in turn need to make our green infrastructure projects do. Um, but then we also want to maximize the community benefits that you get with that. So like I mentioned before, we can bring in some things that come along with the green infrastructure, like those native plantings or maintenance paths that can dual as trails um, that really give you more visible, tangible benefit from these public investments that you're getting. So green infrastructure comes in many different shapes and sizes. I'm just going to talk about a couple of them today that um, could apply to the project opportunity that we're looking at. Um, so rain gardens and bioretention basins, they, to the naked eye, look like a normal landscape bed, except for they're going to be a little bit more depressed because, again, they're meant to capture and store stormwater. So they usually have a section of some special soil that's going to absorb water a little bit better than the clay soils you're probably used to seeing in Kansas City. Um, and a lot of times they'll have some additional rock layers underneath there to give even more um, storage and some piping components that can help water get into it or get out of it at the rate we want it to. Bioswales function in much the same way, um, except for you're going to see those more on a hill application, so a slope. So it's really moving water from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill, but you're still getting all of that great benefit as water moves through these systems and filters out those pollutants and slows that stormwater down. So on the 37th and Norton project, we've got a big 
basically natural soil that cut, that runs through um, that heavily wooded area. So it would be something that's stepping down and getting these storage areas in between it. Um, and then detention basins and wetlands. So these are larger type green infrastructure facilities. So a lot of the times they're taking area from further away that's going into a pipe system that then comes to a larger basin that can hold it for a time um, and, and take some water off as well. So they come in wet features. So where you'll see maybe a permanent pool of water like in the top right here, or they come in dry features. So where they just fill up and it rains and then they dry out in between rainstorms. Um, so both applications can bring in that native vegetation. So you can still get a lot of those, that habitat benefit, but it just, um, it, they can look differently. So obviously we've got a park application up here and then on the bottom right there is more, it's in the industrial district. So it looks more just like a lawn area, which in um, a community setting, that lawn area can dual as a play area, an open area too. So there's pros and cons to, to both. And it's more hearing from the community as to what is important to them and what types of features and use of that space they'd like to see. So planning for maintenance, like I said before, these are living systems. So before we go into a green infrastructure project, we want to know that there is a plan to maintain it long term. Otherwise, why invest in it in the first place? So um, the city, Casey Water, has several mechanisms in place right now to do that. Um, and I'm sorry, this is pretty small for you to see, but they have uh, maintenance that they contract out so that they basically put out to bid and have services come in and do. And then they have a couple maintenance mechanisms in-house. So they've got the Green Solutions crew, which is their in-house maintenance crew. Um, and they also work on other maintenance tasks for the city as well in their traditional systems. And then we've got the Green Stewards program, which is um, implemented under the National Green Infrastructure Program, so NGICP. Um, which is a national certification that's geared to train up construction inspection and um, construction inspection and maintenance workers in the field of green infrastructure. So it's a certification that you can get and then you can go and apply it to any other city. Um, and it's, it's up and coming. It's, it's getting a lot better, bigger uh, as far as cities requiring this because green infrastructure is expanding nationwide. So maintenance is a need, um, is a big need both here and everywhere else. So that, that Green Stewards program is a great opportunity for workforce development that the city has invested in over the past, I think, six years or so. Um, but with that, I'm going to let Brian kind of re-summarize the project for you guys and I think open it up to questions. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so um, we talked a little bit about what green infrastructure is and how it may be applicable in the area that uh, we're looking at here at uh, 37th and Norton area. Um, we have um, notified the EPA, or at least let them understand that we're looking at alternative projects from the one that we talked about earlier, and that we were uh, putting together a plan for them to, to review. And part of that is to get feedback from um, the community in the area and understand the desire or uh, the, uh, the expectations that come with green infrastructure that may be in the community area. Um, so that's that's what we want to try and get from you tonight. Part of our uh, part of the information that we provided here is to let you know really what we're trying to accomplish and what it would look like um, in the community. And then as well as get the feedback from you uh, and, and input that uh, uh, of whether or not green infrastructure is desirable in this type of uh, uh, situation. So with that, um, Robert, yes, go ahead. You could uh, acknowledge yes, a woman. I can't tell the problem. We really appreciate her taking the time to be with us tonight. Yes, please come on up. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Your input means everything. If I can have a green infrastructure program or project in every third district neighborhood, I would because they're so critically important for a, for a lot of reasons. 
what is resiliency? We have to be a resilient community as relates to these major storm events that come specifically in the, in the Midwest and in Missouri. Um, and then two, just the beautification of it all and making sure that our communities um, have a, a, that, that um, green infrastructure. I'm pushing the envelope as much as I possibly can from a legislative standpoint. You all know that the federal government gave us an unfunded mandate to separate our storm uh, sewers and our, uh, our, our infrastructure. And so we're trying to, we're the first city in the nation to have an adaptable consent degree, meaning that we can adapt and modify it. And instead of having so much gray infrastructure underneath, we can have green infrastructure. So I make I want to make sure that we get as much of these amenities as possible. They mentioned the Green Stewards Program. It is a huge program as it relates to making sure people returning citizens in our community have jobs. And so we're making sure that they're part of the Green Stewards Program and then opening up more uh, additional jobs through our water department, through our solid waste department to the, uh, for those individuals. So we look forward to your feedback so that we make sure that we install something that you can be proud of. So thank you so much and thank you all for thank you. making this happen today. Appreciate it. Yes. So with that, does anybody have any questions? We've got a lot of people here and we'd like to hear what your feedback is as far as whether um, whether green infrastructure is desirable in the area, where, whether it's uh, something you have more questions about or um, just, just does anybody have any comments they'd like to share? Well, for me, it's difficult to it's difficult to really form questions when we know we have the uh, Heartland uh, Conservation Alliance uh, in the house. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're talking about maybe doing a collaborative, uh, maybe an intersection of ideas. Yeah. So how can we really have a conversation knowing that that's sort of hovering? So how can we go ahead and merge this presentation with that conversation so we can have an intelligent uh, analysis of what we're talking about here. Absolutely. And I think, um, were you going to go ahead and- Yeah, you I'm just going to just introduce myself. Yes, that please do. Fine. So I'm Christina Williams. I'm the program manager over at Heart and Conservation Alliance. Um, unfortunately, our executive director can't be here tonight. He, um, for personal reasons. So I wish that he could be here. He would love to be present at this meeting. But with that being said, as it's been alluded to, some work has already been done in this area, and by work being done, I mean some, some back-end stuff. We've been meeting for about a year now, and I'm rather new to Heartland Conservation Alliance, but um, there's a lot of folks here from our community advisory board that's been formed, as well as our technical advisory group. And these folks have been meeting and talking about what this area could be used for. And I do think that there is possibly a connection between what Smart Sewers is looking at and some of the ideas that the group has already came up with. So um, as you can see back here, there's a couple of um, two separate concepts, we'll call them, that the, uh, the Community Advisory Board has shared input on, has shared ideas on, and started to, to kind of dream up what this space could be used for. Um, and so I do think that it's a great point, how can we, um, work with Smart Sewers, KC Water, as well as, you know, work with everybody who's already put an effort on this project and the community as a whole and try to figure out where we can intersect these two things at. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of times when we start out with the Smart Sewer Green Infrastructure Project, we're, uh, we're starting from scratch with nobody else involved to be able to help or how like this already. So, this is a great opportunity, actually. Yeah, and I, in your presentation, I did see some green infrastructure that was agreeable to, to those plans over there. So uh, I, I think that you definitely need to talk. Uh, the thing I, I was challenging uh, uh, Heartland with is the same thing that I'm challenge uh, uh, Casey Water with, and that is to go into a community that is uh, impoverished but the house is around it like the lap table. And people are concerned about being a, being forced out of their house, even taxed out of their house because of the rise of property value and so forth and so on. Uh, has there been any thought given to how we're gonna support the residents 
that are going to be living alongside, you know, this new green space. Um, that's a big concern for me, you know, to have a lot of investment come in and the outside of the area is beautified, which could have some implications for the ownership of that area. We even talked about uh, uh, tax abatements and things of that nature for folks that are concerned about, quite frankly, if I can just say gentrification. All right. So um, is there been any conversations about that at all? And if not, then maybe we need to add that to the discussion. And I can answer that question because we have been working to make sure that anything that we do, we're overlaying all the city services. So in the area where the green infrastructure is um, going to be happening, that we're talking about um, how are we addressing the other areas, whether it's um, the um, the improvement programs, uh, the housing improvement programs that we have, uh, public works. We don't want to just come in and plop something in. We want to make sure that we're being comprehensive. And so if you're familiar with the CMO approach um, that happened um, in many, many years ago, many city managers ago, uh, where when they go in, when they went in to do power and light, it was all hands on deck from every department. And that's the same approach that we're going in with our green infrastructure projects. So we're not just saying we're going to put this amenity there, but not address the things that are around it, uh, because it's a great opportunity to do to do so. To your question um, around alignment, yes. We, we, that's why we're having this meeting, because we did want to work in silos. You all are, um, you're ahead. And we want to make sure that we are supporting and in alignment with the work that you've already been doing and not coming and going in a different direction. So um, I support us moving, like, let's start with what you ha already have and work through there. Work that, that way. Yeah. <laughs> I just needed you to repeat that one term you uh, mentioned previously, the uh, first one you mentioned to have an adaptable. Uh, Consent decree, an adaptable consent decree where you have yeah, consent cons decree. Decree. Uh -huh. okay, We're under um, two uh, unfunded mandate consent decrees. One with our ADA um, accessibility. So when you see like uh, the ADA ramps, and then also um, our combined sewer program, the smart sewer program. So that's a lot of investment that's happening. Billions of dollars of investment that are happening that we want to make sure that we're getting some resiliency out of it as well and not just all, you know, great infrastructure. So I know some things you can't do bring <laughs> infrastructure, but they know I'm there in the big big like pushing the envelope as much as possible. Well, I was just gonna say one example, you mentioned power and light, but a better example in addition to that may be the Marble neighborhood. Uh, where there was a concentration of resources that went in uh, based on the work that was being brought forward. And you mentioned the city manager. This happened only a few short years ago where you had public works, you had the water department, you had a number of uh, departments that ultimately they met every month to figure out how can we bring all these additional resources to then uh, support this community. And if you've been through the whole neighborhood, it's, it's really amazing if you look back where they started 15 plus years ago to where they are today, but it's exactly because of yeah. what, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. So, the question I have that, uh, for the smart solar program, I think the game we went by is that we go there first to produce more for CISA, how bad that is, but then we start to get the project better things. So when we're in the neighborhood, what else we can add, or what other elements we can add, different levels. And what other uh, uh, collaborations we need from the multiple department perspective? What are the different funding sources we can bring in together so that when you're in the neighborhood, we have a chance to make the community better with the one shot? Or build a process that in a modular way, so means that we do the basic project and create a pathway to build on more and more as the funds become available, as the community needs to grow. So that is what is actually our approach has been. But the point you made, sir, that uh, what would happen we go and put this investment, how that affects the existing residents and uh, why their existence is worth that. Well, what would happen to that? That's a, an angle we did some. We're just scratching the surface for the smart solar project. 
But in any case, uh, and if you go and use the green spaces and you make a clear amenity, that should baseline now. But how fancy you make is the question of what is the community decide. So if I build a green infrastructure, which is essentially taking the rainwater, we're putting into a swale or a little, little pond like you see, you see the plant and flowers on the top, but you see the, the things happen in the bottom. But we put a, a, a pot bench next to it very quickly that benefit grows. Somebody can sit there and watch, or we can create a wall or create a trailer on. That's what we see as the, as the residents that the benefit grows. But underneath, things happen. It's not about management. So that is the approach we are taking in Montreal, what is going on now. Uh, then this project actually is uh, going to advance that uh, thinking. So, as Councilman said, well, this is an integrated thinking approach. Yeah. And to answer your question around the, the tax abatements, we've done it. I've done it through Santa Fe. I've led that effort to make sure that they got the LCRA tax abatement. We're working on the same thing, and that's why I kind of alluded more to power and might because we need to be talking about the economy in the third district as well. And so how do you bring uh, somewhat, sometimes, not all places deserve it, but there is a lot of desperation and we need to bring it, you know, up to a middle class standard. But we also have to protect the people that are there, that have been there. And the EDC is working on an overlay for tax abatements. Um, so we don't have to pay an, uh, an expensive flight study because anybody with two eyes um, can see, hear, and smell. If you don't, if you, if, if even if you you have vision problems, you know that the, this community is blinded, and so we shouldn't have to pay ten thousand dollars for a flight study. But that's the type of thing that we're trying to overlay with the areas that we're going in. Not just we, we have to think about the people that are. Yeah. yeah. I did, have, I did have two questions. I just was trying to write that term down, but I apologize. I didn't uh, clarify. I wanted to ask those questions. Uh, but real quickly, uh, how how can community, and it was mentioned, I heard uh, green collar jobs. And I heard that term. And then Ms. Robinson stated as well, working with the community to to have jobs such for such forth. But being a little bit more specific within the scope of the project, how can community partners and investors engage in the construction process of this uh, project? We talked about it on our end. And then are there any small business owners that can be utilized within the scope of this contracting process? Example, I'm a landscaper, licensed and insured uh, by trade. Uh, I know that, you know, right off the bat, it would seem like an immediate problem just with the existing contractor, say, smart, so whoever you contract, nobody's trying to share their money. You know, well, that's an immediate conflict because I'm not trying to receive less funds for the scope of this project. But you do have, and it's like UMK, what we did with UMKC, we were canvassing our neighborhood, needing to know who lives in your neighborhood because there are existing business owners there are thriving, you know, people who can contribute in a major way and impact them economically, uh, address some of these economic, you know, issues that we have simply by utilizing who's there. Uh, if these people can, because what I'm doing, how I plan to merge the two, really, honestly, I'm sorry I'm talking now, but it is just listening. But when I look at certain things and from, from a landscaper point of view, I'm just lacking the education. I didn't know the different types of landscaping styles, how far landscaping goes. These are opportunities for me to grow my business as well. But I'm limited, so that's why I get hired just to cut grass. Because what do I know? What can I do? How can I contribute? But if I'm a landscaper and landscapers encompasses everything you guys are doing, well, it sounds like I need to educate myself and gain a trade to grow my business. So in and specifics to the people in the community, small business owners, economic impact. Going forward, can we uh, consider those expanding our who we contract, you know, who we include, and then we talk about race issues. Are the people that we're contracting, what's what's the what's the diversity? What's the you know a little more detail? 
you know, us as the community members, we just we want to be we want to be as nosy as hell. Yeah, we, we need we need to know as much as we can know instead of you know instead of just showing up and saying right. yeah that sounds cool. Mm -hmm. No, really get down to the business of it and consider mm -hmm. using utilizing people in the community in these projects. I, I, still, I, still, I, have, I have I have a question. Oh, let, me, let me ask uh, Mr. Parsons something, and then because I don't want us to give us the the padded contracting. Like I don't want to talk about <laughs> the contractor. We can't we can't just go through. We can't do it the, the way we normally do it. But um, if you can talk about uh, Mr. Parsons, is there a way? Because we talk about building the capacity of businesses in the third district to be able to be in the green infrastructure space. Um, is there an opportunity uh, for us to engage small businesses in the community so that they can grow and then have access to some of these billions of dollars? We signed a 12, what was it, 12 million dollars? How much was the term? 12, 12 million dollars yeah. with Burns and McDonald. Oh, who's here for Burns and McDonald? Oh, okay. So these are the people with the twelve million dollars. To work with us uh, in building this out. So, and since she's going to you for an answer, I'm gonna need your car. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, first of all, Councilwoman's right. You know, when you think about where we are as um, a, a program and when you think about the opportunities for small businesses, I think there are a number of opportunities. Uh, one of the things you have to do is figure out, like you said, bro, the, the scope of your, your, your scope of services. Uh, the, the program is always looking to uh, get folks involved, you know, um, you know, one of the boards I sit on is bridging the gap, for example. And you have a lot of these different entities that are out here that are looking to partner with people for different uh, scopes of work. And, uh, you know, whether it's landscaping or, you know, I know uh, from engineering architecture, you know, that's a whole other skill set. But there are opportunities out here for businesses like yourself to get the training and get scaled up, then to pursue these types of projects. Can we commit to having a meeting uh, with these businesses so that we can further explore these opportunities um, around the table? Yeah, I mean, I would. Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, speak up. No, it's really good, very good uh, feedback. I think uh, excellent points. So, so Brian, you can add to this. Uh, we are, we needed a uh, lot more capacity community to do green infrastructure. So if you have the skills, one thing we're kind of ready to do is having a open house with uh, providing information, what kind of green infrastructure coming and what kind of skills we need so that uh, you know how you can be part of that project. Delivery. So uh, please provide your contact information to the list. I think maybe you know, we talked about it, we scheduled it, Brian. Oh, that's one way you can get engaged to see what's in the pipeline, but you could be part of it. That's one. Uh, I think Lauren mentioned about uh, there's a certification program for uh, uh, installing and maintaining the infrastructure. There's a national certification. That actually, we're just opening up training centers. So there is a uh, few provider information we could uh, send you. Actually, I sent the actual communication yesterday for some target. Uh, uh, entities uh, has been doing uh, the infrastructure work, so we can add uh, your name to the list. So, so, there's a yeah. so you know, but there's a five, six different classes you take. Uh, then you write you know, just a very simple test. Then you get a national certificate mm -hmm. as your green infrastructure professional. Right. Now it's a good thing to have. We're promoting it. Or you mentioned the board. Jason mentioned the board. Uh, green Stewards program, right? Part of that we have a contract with the bridging gap. Yeah. As of providing, this is what the councilman referred that these are the folks coming back to the workforce or have a, some challenges in their life. They're coming back to the mainstream, do the work. So it gives an opportunity for those folks, but also anybody. So there's another opportunity to get connected or to bridge the gap, <laughs> present your qualifications, your desire to work, see if they can, we can work through that uh, contract. So there's different ways to do it. But uh, let's uh, let's share the information, and uh, but in concept, I agree what you're saying. 
but you just stop getting into the process is the one that's really challenging. And then sustaining it. Yeah. And just imagine if every uh, every house in the neighborhood had a stormwater program in, in their front yard, yeah. like in terms of people in the community and solving those. So, okay, you that you wanted to wrap it up now. Is it my time now? Yeah, it's your time. Sorry. It's always your time. You know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, third district, first of all, have had um, sewer problems years now. And I've been there 57 years. And uh, just right outside my door already, uh, pipes are down. I, I, I've never understood why until the gentrifying has started to happen. There's never been any addressing anything that looked like pairs of sewer lines. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I'm on this heart day thing and I, I really, I'm, I'm going to go for it. But I'm just still trying to figure out how we've just kind of missed their district all together so far. And it's just pipes and, and water spans mm -hmm. in, in those, those basins that they, they got the nice orange on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's throughout this community, starting at Linwood. I live in 33rd. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just right outside my house, I'm looking at, uh, okay, covered up, crushed pipes. So, I mean, are we, I'm somewhere near all this that's happening, but I'm just a little bit confused about what, what are we going to do about the third district and the replacement that never happened for. You know, all those, 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 she was saying, every, water, every standing, day, water standing everywhere. Every time, and they can attest, the staff can attest to this, every time we approve a water bond replacement, I'm always asking, what about the third district? What about you? And so, Happy one of the Happy. things that we can do in terms of um, galvanizing support, <laughs> it's an inside, outside game. I'm glad all of y'all are here today because you can you can really impact what's happening at City Hall. So what we need to do is have a policy that says that the environmental justice zip code zones, these are areas that have been historically impacted and neglected, by, and, neglected and disinvested. The EPA, which we're under this consent decree, already has these zip codes and these zones already identified. But we need our staff people to be directed when they go to pick water line replacements that they're looking at it from an equitable approach and saying that the neighborhoods and the communities that have been disinvested that are to the front years. of the line because we've been at the back of the line intentionally for, for decades upon decades upon yes. decades. And so, but that takes policy. That's not a staff decision. That's your council people making a decision that that's how we're going to use our resources. In our business plan, the first word is equity. We want to create equitable neighborhoods, but then when you look at our budget and you look at how we're spending money, then there becomes some challenges. So um, I'll be introducing something around the EJ uh, environment, environmental justice areas for water line replacements, and I hope that you all can be engaged in that conversation. So... It's a policy decision to answer your question. Any other questions? I'll throw one last one in there. And then so we can talk about where we go from here. I was, I was just quickly, I meant when you mentioned Bridge and the Graph, there was a, a Arborist program with Bridge and the Graph that they were in that I was actually highly anticipating participating in. But there were some policies around that. Uh, that did not allow me to engage in that. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what I would just uh, throw out there the last little piece. We got to make sure the policies are in, in, inclusive yeah. and especially in court and in, in accordance with the, the American Constitution. So the, there was a lot of politics that would help me from participating in that. And, and well, let's cut it short. I sit on the board, so <laughs> I'm going to give you my card. I'm going to give you my card. Okay. We talked about the prison and gap program. Yes, sir. If you call me, we're going to work through it. If not, then we're not. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. I don't know if the HCA is in the heartland. 
I think I wrote down that you said this was like 195 acres that you were at. So that's an extensive amount of land. It is. And so. That's the crazy area. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So as far as our project goes, the city would then, um, they own most of the land in one form or another anyway, mm -hmm. because land bank and stuff right. would be retaining. And that, that, how, that is what like I, how extensive yeah. would this cover the whole Palestine? Um, Al, you may know better on the, the ownership pieces, but this, uh, I think this area basically through here is, as you can see, these, already, the, yeah, these parcels are already uh, from the land bank. Uh, they are from land bank or they are the Kansas City uh, Home Setting Authority. Right. Are predominantly the ownership of those. There are several properties that are completely owned. Uh, one by a, a, a church, a Baptist church, I believe. And then there's a developer who owns at the very southern end, uh, down on 37th. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's Kansas City Land Bank and Kansas City Homesteading Authority. So the right. city would be owning and maintaining. Yes, the green infrastructure in this area, yes, we would be maintaining that uh, to keep it functional and to keep it um, looking good. But I believe you have some open space reservations with the Home City Authority um, that, that yeah, Archer sure. has. I was just um, curious, you know, as far as, so our input into this then is just what I think it should look yeah. like or... Right. Okay. Right. Well, I think I think really what we want to give you feedback about is green infrastructure a good idea for this area? Is this how we want to be able to, to treat a combined sewer overflow downstream? Uh, and and as Lauren pointed out, and others, I mean, it does provide those amenities as well. Um, and there's another great project with ideas in the same vicinity that hopefully you know we can we can share ideas and. and Co benefits out of it. So um, I think that's that's one of the ideas about using these particular areas in the tracks that are not, um, that are identified here. Yeah, provide feedback <clears throat> with the stormwater component to this area right. so against yeah. your uh, objectives. So to answer your question, is that to, we've been meeting uh, for over a year to get that question answered, not because uh, it's, it, it should be a no-brainer. It's because that question is layered with a lot of distrust in terms of, you know, development in the urban core. Um, as Dr. Johnson stated, that there have been a lot of promises made over lot, several so. years. And so you have a constituency that's dealing with a lot of trust issues that are rooted in history, uh, yeah. you know, the, the dealings with the city's history. And so uh, I don't know how well we've been able to document. I think we've done a really good job documenting a multitude of conversations that we've had around the area of trust. Um, and so, as you stated, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, but it probably would do you good to just try to uh, wrap your heads around some of the things that we've already dealt with. Uh, anybody who uh, looked at this presentation and understood it would say, obviously, sure. But that's not the that's not the reality of the history. Right. The first half you said you said you're showing not ideas to ideas need to come to fruition as something Government makes a road, you know, you give your proofs, right? So that's why we don't get things done and they have this trust. But with the consent decree, the government talked about it, we have a time bound goals to accomplish two things. So where we're sitting right now is we had a project with the that we the the books we supposed to implement. Now we said, wait a minute, we have an opportunity to do that. So we're doing with the green infrastructure. So we notified EPA for intent, uh, actually I communicated this week with them again. That we are having public meetings and we're going to come back with the 
an alternative process. Once the EPA is through, it's a time bomb. They give us a day. Now, show we should meet this day. You complete this kind of achievement of our project. But if we go on, they start finals. So it is going to happen. If people are going to see the project happens. Well, no, not necessarily yeah. that. Go ahead. Right. And so yeah. I, I think where we need to go from here is what are some things that the city can do today that will demonstrate that we yeah. can be trusted? So one of the things, so that's what we need to one of the things that comes to mind is, is that uh, present, because you have to present, but present with the residents in mind. In other words, just we need to talk about the trees, we need to talk about the greenness, we need to talk about the fresh water, we need to talk about sewage water, but we also need to talk about the people. So include the people in the presentation. And so if there's going to be a plan, wherever promises that are made need to be a part of the plan up front. And so people can hear what the intentionality is. But there may be some things. Um um, like what that was stated, that you have identified as problems that may not even be connected to the green infrastructure project yeah. that we can get done in advance. Yeah, one of the things and is never motivated, right? One of the yeah, one of the one of the things is um some very good things can happen uh, in terms of property values and in terms of the aesthetics of the neighborhoods and all of those types of things. Um, the county is, is reassessing properties as we speak. Uh, there is a fear and a concern of whether or not people are going to be able to afford the houses that they live in. Right. And so some of the tax abatement conversation comes out of that, that, mm -hmm. that anxiety. Uh, that, that, and then also there are other programs, and I think Councilwoman Robinson made a reference to there are some programs that the community should anticipate being able to take advantage of that will help improve the aesthetics of the actual property that are there. I've heard porch improvement programs, paint programs, some of these things that have gone away, some of them are coming back. Um, some, uh, some covenants with those particular neighbors that say, if you live in this area, we're committed to keeping the streets paved. We're committed to keeping the sidewalks you know what I'm saying? Um, we're committed to providing uh, services. You know, now these things sound like natural things, but these things are not happening in, in that particular neighborhood. And so we need to make a commitment to make sure that they happen. You know? This is in the CTEB area, too, right? I, I missed that. I'm sorry. No, what's the what's the address again? The, the what's the boundaries? Uh, Thirty-seven and Norton is the. Oh, uh, Norton is. Yeah. Uh, no, it is the it, yeah. So what? Yeah, that's in CTEB. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Maybe um, looking at speed bumps in certain areas. Okay. Safety. Okay. Um, so I have. The urban um, renewal tax abatement, minor home repair, sidewalk improvement, street replacement. Uh, what was the last one you just said? And uh, safety. Oh, speed bumps. Well, I can, can I just add on that? I think that's important what you're saying. And even when you looked at the survey that we looked at a year ago, when we heard from the residents and how that they would envision this parcel with this great forested land, I mean, their concerns were so much from the disinvestment of the area, even around their house. They, they weren't as concerned about the forested areas they were maybe They have no street lights, mm -hmm. no street lights. So there's no trash, there's no big sidewalks, no pothole. I mean, everything that the city is not doing, so it's just been built up for years. I mean, that tends to be like the top priority. And it's hard to see the, the you know, that someone's coming in to make something pretty and that it seems um, trustful. Um, I mean, it, it's just, it's hard. I mean, this is great. Can, can I ask a question too, just that also yeah. about this project? I'm just trying to understand the timeline, how this is working. I mean, when you see this project, it, it's because your tasks were changing and getting rid of the super system. So how does this fit in and what's the timeline? It, I'm just trying to figure out like, how, how, how does, what, what am I trying to say? Who gets the land? This is owned by the city, the land bank. 
do does KC Low Waters become the owners of the parcel of land? Like, do you come in now because this is something that's a priority? It was given 40 years ago by the EPA. Is it kind of no longer going to the HCA and the other projects? Like, how? What's the future and the direction? And how do you envision this partnership? It's a good question. You know, at KC Water, we do. Um, lots of projects that we had in parks. So we have partnerships with our parks department. Um, there are different partnerships that we have, even um, private public partnerships with other entities like Kansas City University. We are doing a project with them. They own the land. We have a project on land and we actually uh, uh, maintain it as well. Um, so there are different ways and means to, to conduct the project and have ownership or maintenance uh, elements that may be different uh, entities are in charge of. So I don't know that that answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's uh, with your concern, we understand. I think uh, it's a, as we go through the project locations, the land bank, the land bank, land bank Buying of land to build a project, but we will we are coming to maintain the infrastructure to the right. But I think that there is some opportunity for us to have a partnership with the Heartland um, with you all to figure out those details. So that's okay. yeah. the timeline. Really, today we're at the point that we're we are uh, going to need to wait to life first for the submit the EPA. It is our alternative plan. This is what we're going to do. So all the benefits we accomplish through it, got multi-community benefits and all that. And then we put it provide a timeline for the project implementation, which includes the design. Well, it probably takes probably at least a good year. Yeah, probably a year and a half. Year and a half design. And then we would be taking the construction after it, but for now, probably a good year, year class. And, and during the design, it's only we do a lot of public outreach yeah. and being back here, you know, several times to talk as, as the project gets further along. So we're talking about roughly three to four years from now to actually see the project built. But then the, this is the beginning conversation. Once we create a full of project, then we conceive the project that we have acquired a design professional to do the work. We'll be coming multiple times to the community with uh, more details, with all the details as we go with the prototype design. So it's going to be a journey, the process. And I would love to see um, and advocate if there's like an MOU before that July meeting that you all would like to see um, so that we can codify that with them before the meeting with. EPA. So the people conversation is front and center that comes from you all and not from us. Yeah, there is a more of a of submittal, not a meeting. Meeting can happen later. But we're going to be submitting to our interest about the alternative project. Right now, with the existing project, we're not meeting the consent decree deadline. So we have, we have a risk for the city not meeting the date will create, uh, you know, uh, fines and such. So we're trying to get them to change the current project definition and move the completion date to 26. Explain what the change is. What are we changing? We're we'll changing there's an existing project. That's what the beginning part, but there's a relief towards so pipes. Okay. Great pipes to take the wall post uh, capture. So we're just changing. We are actually uh, that was a 2010 concept degree. Okay. So we're saying that the point of that, we're gonna present the alternate project. Green. Which is the green infrastructure keeping the. I just want to make sure everybody knows when you say change. Yeah, they were yeah change. we went through, we just showed okay. that uh, okay. before the. This was the venue we wanted. Right, that's a change. So we think it's a good change. We're trying to show them all the multi benefits and all that. And also, with this process with the new project, uh, I we have 190 acres of area, we've been going there and <laughs> fill a bed and stormwater pipes, spread the water away from the combined pipes that you see. The separate pipes bring you to these green edges on the tree. So there will be uh, new source. We will be getting new source in the area too. And whenever our source are replaced in the street, they will have the, um, the full lane replacement of the street as well. So I'll have, um, well, and I would definitely invite you all, or maybe if there's some information I can, that can be shared, if we can go on a tour of the area, have the department directors 
on the tour. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the water line replacements, the the potholes that need to be repaired, the you know, I mean, there's again legal dumping happening in the area that that needs to be addressed. But we can try to get that you know coordinated, and we would love for you guys, you know, someone to get on the bus, but the the help support. That. Okay, so you're going to get that. Okay, Mr. Parson. Uh, so we just need to get that going in the next couple of weeks. Yes, Councilwoman. All right, good. <laughs> With the, so I I work at Heartland Conservation Alliance in the nature area of the park as a nature action crew leader, and I just completed an environmental justice certificate. So I'm really like listening to the concerns that people are saying because there's been a lot of environmental injustice within this community for many years. Many years. And so that's very frustrating to have someone new after there's been like a year of this project being done with Heartland Conservation Alliance to come in and say, because now they have a consent decree from the EPA and the consent decree pretty much being that they're being sued, right? Yeah. The city is being sued. Yeah. And so there needs to be action done immediately. And so, and so that's been in place for, yeah, for 10 years. And so, we need to do this in a way that the people are going to be the ones who are being involved because they're the ones who've been suffering the impacts of this injustices. And so with that being said, we need to do it in a way that is also going to help their health and so that they can understand how the green infrastructure is going to impact that health. And so that something that's going to be sustainable, because at the end of the day, who's going to have to pay that? Is that going to be the people that's going to have to pay for those costs? We're already paying your mm -hmm. water bills, yeah. right? But we're not getting any. We're not getting any climate change benefit in the third year. The the the, <laughs> the third district has the lowest amount of green space in any other district. That is the health issue. I have had my grandma down the street. I went to Wendell Phillips. The the, the the all of the pollutants and everything came right to when we played on the playground. So I understand what you're saying. We're trying to push the envelope to say if you're not just going to go into some neighborhoods and do green infrastructure, you're going to come to the third district too because we need to benefit. And when there is a weather related event with you know a uh, brain event, we're going to suffer the the, the most. Right. I mean, we, we have the, we have the oldest housing stock in the city. Yes. So it's our basements that are flooded. Yes. So we need those rainwater capture programs as well. Mm -hmm. But yes, whatever we do has to be rooted. And I'm not, we're not going to come in and helicopter in and paternalize anything. You all have already set the chart. You know what you want. We want to join with you in making sure that those that we can align together. Um, and so any blame around why this project is here, you can lay it at my feet because I've been fighting to get more great infrastructure, especially in the third district. But I do understand that there's been decay and the, it's been intentional things that the city has done to overlook the community that we have to make right. Um, and we have to do that, I think, before we can ask you to trust us. So I appreciate the conversation. I think we need to get to work. Yeah. Yeah, he was all angry. <laughs> 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 I get I guess just to wrap it up too, uh, as Serena talked about earlier, we'll be providing your feedback to um, to the EPA with our submittals uh, related to this project. Um, and then the, the last piece on here is that before we even start design on these projects, you know, as we get further down the road in the next year, that input will be coming, um, that input from you will be coming back into the design of those projects and incorporating all of that input from uh, the community and, and obviously from the plans that have already been developed as well. Yes. Can we get, as a part of the submission, can we <clears throat> sure we submit those ideas that are back there? As a part of the submission to the EPA? Can we I, those? I've, 
think that might, I'll have to. Yeah, I think that we would uh, definitely share uh, when they ask a detailed question at this point, they're asking, can we do our own yeah, I think uh, that they will be with the information we already have about the 70 green acres we have accomplished and the you know uh, sustainable solution. I think they'll all be they're more amicable to change the policy definition. And then as we create the policy, they will ask for more details. I think that's when we can take the how. Well, we're going to say that HCA has been working on. Yeah, this we'll story. incorporate that into this. The, oh yeah, thing. Oh, it's this thing. Yeah. Uh, if community plans already underway. Right. Or what we do? What we do is going to align that into the hydrology and hydraulics. Okay. To bring the flow into those areas and manage. Yeah. And then anything else beyond this smart sort of program intent of managing flows, we can always look at the project better on this. Maybe we will look at the other other elements we can add to. Also, through the pilot funding or yeah. other type of funding, we can add more amenities to it. So EPA will know based on what we learned today that community is already uh, engaged in to creating green spaces. Yeah. I have a quick question. Maybe Christina might be going here. I don't know. No, it works. But we've been talking a lot about these things like right here and these ideas and what the community or what the community advisory board, their HDA has already been doing. We'd really love for you because I'm not seeing that. Even if you have. Um, to come back and look at these Absolutely. and to understand how they were developed and what they represent because they are ideas. When these were developed, there was no conversation about green infrastructure. We didn't know this was a thing that was out there. In fact, we had heard a lot of stories about people back in the day, they used to fish either back here or in this area. There was some standing water, different things. And so we had a lot of um, conversation and doing some data search about trying to find where the water was. But the project was not focused on green infrastructure. It's focused on ecosystem services and really thoughtful community investment. We think about that, we think about urban farming, we think about education, we think about native planting, we start thinking about play areas, we start thinking about lots of different things. And so how many of you are part of the CAP? All of these people. Some of you are here, this would be a really great opportunity to have you all look through this. And I know you had someone who was from the CAP who had volunteered to do yes. things, and I'm right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> he was, um, I think, Erica, would you share a little bit about the experience of helping to develop some of these? It's nothing to say. Oh, come back and look at this. Wrong. Everybody stand <laughs> up, stand up, move up out of the chair, and come to the back of the room. 